Amen. Good morning. Have a seat. We uh, give a hand to our lovely band. <laughs> oh, you getting that? Oh, thank you. I'm just, uh, nothing, nothing gets me in the mood to hear some preaching than some good singing. I'm just traditional Southern. Um, thank you. Thank you, Rogers. Thank you, Dave. I totally forgot the uh, clicker. Throw that up here. Well, first of all, um, I want to thank uh, a few people. One, I thank all of y'all for being patient with me. Uh, this is the trilogy, per se, so hopefully I bring every, everything to a conclusion and solidify some points for everybody. And I want to thank uh, Pastor Chris's family for coming back. <laughs> so uh, um, if you never had the chance to preach or anything, it, it is... Um, stressful is not the right way to say it, but one, you want to make sure you represent what the Bible says, but at the same time, um, in this day and age, you get so many critiques from so many avenues, and I'll talk about a couple of those that I received uh, because it's relevant. And some of it's warranted, some of it uh, is not always. There we go. Before we get into my sermon, though, I didn't want to talk through a few things because obviously what's on everybody's mind is, uh, like Lance had said, we haven't had a pandemic since 1918, um, and obviously there's going to be hysteria. There's going to be a lot of things. No one knows what the next couple months is going to look like. And what I would like to put out is that we have a chance as believers, a golden opportunity per se, to truly reflect the glory of God, all right? Despite what happens, I mean, it's, I don't know, crazy stuff is ahead. We know that. But there is no excuse, no reason not to reflect the glory of God in what we do. So I want to give you three principles real quick. We're not going to anchor on this. I just want to give you something uh, to go forward with in this uh, time of hysteria and crisis we're dealing with. The first is peace. Jesus answered them saying, do you now believe Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things that I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Next thing we need to have is trust. Verse there, and of course I'll read here, I, I shouldn't be looking back reading, trust. Um, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind there in 2 Timothy 1.7. The next thing we should be exhibiting is joy. I won't read this entire passage there for you, 1 Peter 1, 6 through 9. If you want to write that down, study it. But these are the three points I want you to walk away with. Why this... Why this Crisis right now is a golden opportunity for us as believers. One, peace because we know God's plan will prevail. Despite what's going to happen and nobody knows what's going to happen, we know that God's will, God's kingdom will prevail. And we have peace because of that. Trust, we have trust because we know that the Holy Spirit empowers each of us to encounter and to endure and to deal with whatever lies before us. And we each may have a different path. And you see that really in the prophets. I'm always amazed when you read through the prophets how, um, or the Old Testament in particular, you have a gentleman like Abraham who lives pretty much a, a peaceful life or a king uh, who doesn't go through much trouble. Another king, his life is nothing but misery. And so we can never compare each other's lives. Just recognize the fact that the Holy Spirit has given you the power to endure whatever he puts you through. So trust in that. And the last one is joy. Because we know that in the end, we receive salvation, the greatest gift of all. And that should give us genuine joy. Um, there's a famous cliche that people like to reach out to. There's a monk, I forget which particular monk it was, that says, I always give the gospel, rarely do I use words. Um, I'm not a fan of that cliche because a lot of people use that as a defense against openly proclaiming the gospel. And for those that would use that, I would say, okay, this is, this is <laughs> the Wuhan virus is your chance to express that. And you can do that with peace, trust, and joy in God, okay? All right, so let's get back uh, into our stuff today. Let's close this trilogy, and hopefully I'm going to give you some good stuff uh, to walk away with. Uh, I left you with a teaser last time that I really feel that 
as a Christian, it is, in my opinion, it is a sin to hold to the, thought, the theory of evolution. And I'm going to explain that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the reasons for that pretty explicitly today. Now, going through a quick review, we talked about our terms, doctrine of creation, what it is, uh, the theory of evolution. If you didn't get that last time, I think this is something you really need to have in your back pocket. I guess now we're going to go slide by slide. Um, these four big bangs, when you deal with someone who's into the theory of evolution, if you understand the all the factors that have to occur for these to happen, for something to come from nothing, life to come from non-life, humanity to come from animals, all right, for this brain, this amazing brain that has abstract thought, absolute understanding in terms of absolutes, um, for that brain to develop out of an instinctual animalistic brain, the, the jump is exponentially difficult. So if you understand those big bangs and you challenge evolutionists on that, uh, I think it'll encourage you a lot. Talked about these four points. All, they're all quantified or culminated in that last one, stand on his truth with trust and dependence. So these are the two truths that we've established so far, that we are ambassadors for Christ, and the doctrine of the creation is God's truth. So we're going to move forward from that. Last week, we talked about, um, and real quick, I want to say that if you felt that I was going to get up here and when we talk creation and evolution and give a lot of, hey, this is the science and this is the science, um, I didn't, and the reason is understand that when you do a science and science battle, you, no one can win. There's two parts of the reason that. One is modern science is based on naturalism. We talked about this. Their fundamental assumption is you cannot give a supernatural explanation for anything. So that, and in, so no matter what they see, they must explain it in a natural way. So you can never win the argument with a person who says you can never give a supernatural explanation. So it's, they ha it's a circuit, there's the circuit argument, you gotta understand that. The second part of that is, is what is the definition of science? It has to be observable and falsifiable. So that means that there's forensic science, which is you look at evidence from the past, and there's operational science. So you can never prove creation or evolution because no one can observe it and no one can falsify it. So those two limiting factors is why I'm trying to teach everybody here to come at it from a different angle, which is philosophy, all right? Most people believe that science is king. Most people believe that you can prove it scientifically. It makes it 100% true, or, or that's the ultimate authority of science. And we have to teach people that that's not correct. Science does not teach us morality. Science does not teach us about love. Science does not teach us about religion. It is limited. And again, science is a tool of humanity. By definition, it is something that we observe and we prove. So it is under our authority because we're the ones who do the science. Does that make sense? So we have to come at it from a different angle, which is philosophy. So these reasons I've been giving you for creation above evolution are theological in nature, a lot of them, and philosophical. This first one is a theological reason that I gave you, which is if you embrace the truth of God and you believe it and you live it, you will have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And that is not just applicable to the doctrine of creation, it's to salvation. Uh, for example, when you understand that salvation is a work of Christ, an amazing grace because there's nothing you can do, it's a gift. And when you truly understand that, the peace and joy that you have because you know you can't lose it, you didn't earn it, it was given to you, you've accepted it, that peace and joy that you now have far surpasses the person who struggles with eternal assurance because they think in some way they can lose it. And so there's so many truths in the Bible that once you really embrace and understand, the peace that you'll be given from God is tremendous. And that's what I wanted to anchor on in the beginning. The next point we made is the powerful reason. Uh, Romans tells us essentially that if you refuse to see him in creation, you will inevitably, and we'll talk about this in our last point today, but you will inevitably receive more darkness. And that's how he designed it. That's why um, 
the Indian in the jungle argument, you know, you've heard it before. Well, how do you believe in Christianity? What about the Native American, you know, the Indian in the jungle who never sees the gospel? Well, God has clearly said, if anyone will respond to the truth of, of my witness through creation, he'll move heaven and earth to give him special revelation. All right, we have to trust in that. We have to know that God is a good God. I think there's another point I want to make on the powerful reason. Hold on one second. <laughs> so I mentioned earlier that some of the critiques I've gotten, some from the outside, some from the inside. Uh, you know, we post this on YouTube, and I find it amusing. I'm not a big social media kind of guy. I don't even know how to do Facebook. Um, and so I just, I don't know, I just don't pay attention to that kind of stuff. So that's, I'm, I'm kind of, I used to, up to about a few months ago, I had one of those phones. It was, you know, the A, B, B, C, you know, the one, two, three. But someone, obviously, had seen last week's sermon. They didn't actually listen to it. They just saw the title, and so they went on a rant about uh, creation versus evolution. And one of the things I found funny is one of his critiques was comparing the two as apples and oranges. And he even concedes to the fact that creation gives an answer from creation all the way to the end of life, whereas evolution just deals with natural selection. And so I agree with him that it is an apples and oranges um, comparison, but it's not our fault that we have a coherent, cohesive, cogent argument from the origin of everything to the end of life. It's not our fault that science does not have that same capability to answer that. So don't ever be intimidated by what science offers. Last week, if you see in your, um, your notes, there's plenty of resources out there. If you're really into the science, which I encourage you to be, I think Tornado and Junkyard, Darwin's Black Box. There's a lot of tools out there you can use to scientifically address the problem, and I encourage you to do that. I don't by any way knock what great creation scientists are doing or using science by any means. I, I'm all on board with that. I just think the better way to approach it is through a philosophical way. <clears throat> Let's see if I have time to, to – yeah, I got real quick. I'm gonna, so, for example, abortion. I know abortion is a huge, hot topic. And I've always made the argument that I think one of the challenges that we're making in abortion is we're asking, we're focusing on the wrong question. As pro-life people, the question that they like to focus on is, when does life begin? If you ever watch it, it's, <clears throat> it's always, see the billboard, the heartbeat begins at this, we can sense pain. The nexus of their push is when does life begin, which is a great question, a necessary question, but it's a scientific question. And you're fighting for people's mind. You will never win with people's mind. You have to get to the heart. And the heart question to ask is, um, I'm going to use an extreme example to drive this home. In Germany, during the Nazi war, and Greg, Pastor Greg, your wife's not here, so I'm not going to murder this pronunciation, uh, it's Levens uns wird leben, life unworthy of life. It started out in a time prior to Nazi Germany when uh, the German nation started uh, to legalize basically euthanasia for people they felt unworthy of life. And that continually proceeded up until its culmination during the Nazi uh, extermination of the Jewish race. So, we're asking the wrong question. We should be asking what life is worth protecting? Because that's a heart question. Is there any life worth protecting more than an innocent child in a mother's womb? There's, there's not. And so that's, in my opinion, we should, when life begins is a great question, but the better question is when does life begin, or what life is worth protecting? All right. So in the same way, what I'm trying to do here during these last three weeks is help you understand that if we get in a science-for-science science battle about evolution, we're not going to win. We can't win because it's a battle of the minds, and it's the heart that we have to affect. And that's not to say that Christ and God hasn't given us all the evidence that we need to prove his point, that he created it. So, that should bring us up to speed where we're at today. Powerful reason. Or this should be, it should say pivotal reason up there. I apologize for that. Um, 
And this is believers. This, this is the, the, the gem of my trilogy here. This, this point here that we're going to anchor on. This is why we as believers must not ever elevate or proclaim the theory of evolution. And we're going to get into it. <clears throat> Passage I'm reading here is going to be from 1 Corinthians 15. Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not risen. And if Christ has not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he has raised up Christ whom he did not raise up. If in fact the dead do not rise... For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death. For since by man came death. By man also came the resurrection of the dead, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 23-28. So the first point of the resurrection is that Christianity without the resurrection equals hopelessness. There is no other clear statement than the passage we read out there. If we don't have a resurrection, we are the most pitiable creatures on the face of this earth because we have placed all our hope in something that is false. The next truth, death is for man, not God. Death is for man, not God. In Romans 5, verses 12 through 17, this point is driven home. Therefore, just as through one man sin into the world and death through sin... And thus death spread to all men because all sin. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many." And the gift is not like that which came to the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness which will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. I mean, I don't think there's a point to argue that death came from man. I mean, he said it in 1 Corinthians here, in, uh, and so I apologize, I actually had that, if you can read that. <coughs> it's undeniable what the Bible is saying. Death came from man. Death is not part of God's plan. Death is God's enemy, not his catalyst. And what I mean by that is, in the theory of evolution, death is the catalyst for life, right? Because the... In and again, I'll mention this. Uh, one of the critiques the gentleman said is theory of evolution only deals with natural selection. Well, I think the vernacular, the modern karma of vernacular is when people say theory of evolution, they mean from uh, the cosmological evolution, how we got something out of nothing all the way uh, to humanity. So... In order in that system of mutation and natural selection, you have to, there's a lot of death. You have to death and approve, death and approve, death and approve. And at some point, Adam, how many million of deaths would have had to have occurred or billions of deaths would have had to occur before Adam came along? That's the theory of evolution. Well, the Bible is explicit that death did not come from him. It came from man. And these are just some verses for you to reference that 
God clearly sees death as his enemy. I mean, in 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 12, he abolishes it. In Isaiah 25, 8, he swallows up death forever. In Revelations, death is thrown to the lake of fire. There will be no more death. The Bible does not talk about death as some tool to get life. He talks about it very clearly as his enemy. Death is conquered by God, not champion. Just the last part of that verse there, 1 Corinthians 15, 23 through 28. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. The last enemy. <coughs> so the reason that the doctrine of creation undergirds the resurrection, which without the resurrection, we don't have hope, is that the point of the resurrection was for God to overcome death. It is illogical, and again, you have to understand, God gave us a brain to think. It is 100% illogical to say, I made death to create life, and then I'm going to send myself to die this horrific death to conquer death that I made to make life. That makes literally no sense. That is 100% illogical. You know, I forget, um, uh, what do we call that in law enforcement? Uh, I'm forgetting. There's a something, I forget the legal term for it, but there's something in law enforcement where if you create the situation where you have to use self-defense, you may not be able to claim self-defense. Uh, the classic example that's used is, you know, you're having, a, you're having an affair with another man's wife, and then that man comes in, and then you end up killing that man you might not be able to claim self-defense at that point because you created that situation. Um, you know, another example that we use in law enforcement is if a, somebody is trying to flee a crime scene or driving a car and you step in front of the car and, and shoot, you may not be able to claim self-defense because you stepped in front of a car. Um, there's a lot of case-by-case -case basis. But I say that to say this, it does not coherently or cogently fit that God would use death for billions of years, billions of deaths to make Adam and then create this narrative where I'm going to come to this earth as a man and die so I can conquer that which I use to make life. It, it, it makes no sense. So understand if you change, and this is the culminating point here, if you change the narrative to the theory of evolution, the problem is this, and follow me with his points, and this is why, in my opinion, it is truly a sin to promote the theory of evolution as a Christian. We have our first point. We know without a doubt, death is the mechanism of evolutionary ideologies, all of them. And that's why I made the comment that I do not support intelligent design. And let me explain what I mean by that. The unifying factor in the intelligent design movement, and I realize there's no intelligent design headquarters, there's no like central publication that you can go reference for intelligent design. It's just kind of a movement. But the unifying principle in intelligent design is this. If you believe that God somehow had a hand in creation or evolution, you're welcome in intelligent design. So most people champion that, but I would say if you're a more discerning Christian, you realize that the person who says God had a hand in evolution cannot be the God of this Bible because of this, and we're going to go through this. So death is the mechanism. You can't have any evolutionary theory without death being the mechanism that makes it possible. Next, we know that God is the originator of life. I mean, that's fundamental to what we believe. To support any Evolutionary ideologies, you must accuse God of three things. The first is bringing death into his good creation. You must say, God, I do not believe what you said that Adam brought death in. it. I believe that you created death to get life. Next, you must say, you used death to design humanity. You were unable to make man in the garden whole, mature, ready to go. You had to use billions upon billions of protozoas, amoebas, 
um, lizards with wings, etc., until we came out with man. And then, most blatantly, you must say that you have described death in a deceitful manner. If you use the theory of evolution, and then you wrote a book that says, I am coming to conquer death that man brought in, I mean, that's called a lie. You are accusing God of lying. I mean, have we completely lost the fear of God? I think in your notes there, I put a few references there. Proverbs, let's see, let me put my notes. <coughs> yeah, Exodus 20, 16, which is the ninth commandment, do not bear false witness. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, if you want to go through that, the seven things God hates, false witness. Hebrews 9 talks about the power of blood, the power of innocent blood. All of those, the two first ones, is it's just my it's just my cautionary tale and my encouragement to believers who are currently caught up in the theory of evolution to recognize what you are doing. Think of the third order effects of what you're doing. You are attributing death to God, and you are in effect accusing him of being a liar. You must recognize that. When you support the theory of evolution, you are telling God, you have said the Bible says this, but you have done something completely different. Any of you that have raised kids, you've had this conversation where you're, that's a lie. I mean, you can try to paint that any way you want to, but there's no other way to look at that. And I don't know how anybody as a Christian who supports the evolution could not say that bearing a false witness and accusing God of that is not a sin. I, I, I don't know. And my heart goes out for them, and I hope they come to a better knowledge of what God's truth says. And that they embrace and trust his word. Because, again, I'll go back to it. It's not what I say. I mean, I'm, trust me, I say enough silly stuff in my life. Um, but if you really believe this was written by an omnipotent, omniscient, infinite God, then why, just, why, why not just believe what it says? Thank you. I know it's, I don't mean to be so somber up here, but let's get into some, some more uh, practical portions. <coughs> now, we've kind of talked through a lot of theological reasons, a lot of scientific reasons why we support uh, the, the doctrine of creation, but I think one of the most practical that we all experience, that we all see, if we're honest, is that bashing the doctrine of creation leads to rebellion. I'm not going to read this entire passage. It is there. <coughs> Excuse me. But Romans, after the first verse we talked about. But look at the result. And this immediately follows the passage which talks about God's design and creation is undeniable. And immediately following that, look at... Women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful. Uh, falls on, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, you know, violent, proud, boasters, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. And I think the most telling part is the very last verse there, 32. That those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. If you read that passage, I mean, again, it looks a lot like the era we're moving into, um, where what the modern culture is trying to push out is that top point. You must recognize, and again, this is a philosophical point, that to have any law, you must have a lawgiver, right? Laws just don't come out of nowhere, which the world puts out. If you don't have a lawgiver, put two verse references there, Judge 17, 21, you end up with anarchy. Now, the world is trying to tell people, and what the world pushes is, if you have autonomy, you will not have accountability. 
This is why the world fights so hard against the doctrine of creation. It's not because it doesn't explain what we see. It's not because they don't see it. It's because they know that if you say there is a creator, you must now be accountable to him. And again, that's why I'm not a huge champion of fighting the science for science battle because, again, it is not a head problem. The evidence is undeniable. Christ has, um, excuse me, God has said in Romans 1, no one will have an excuse for his power in creation. No one. It, it's a heart problem. Because if I, make my, if I recognize it, I must now become accountable to it. The world is trying to teach, and if you have young ones, this is what you need to recognize. The world is trying to teach that if you, don't, if you have autonomy, you have no, no accountability. And life and beauty emerges from this freedom. But we know what is autonomy, what, what really comes out of autonomy. The best example of this, in my opinion, is the virtual world, right? Because people get on a computer, and they can act with absolute impunity. You know, they can create their own virtual life. They can say stuff with not, you know, for example, now I'm a smaller guy, like 180, you know. Um, you know, if I had to come up to Dave in his prime and made fun of him, right, I probably would have eaten five knuckles pretty quick, right? <laughs> That's right. So, but now in this virtual age, right, you can get in there, you can rant, you can call people, you can make memes, you can do all this stuff. There's no consequences for your action. You can be the worst person in the world, worst jerk, and there's no seeming consequences for what you're doing. You know, you can get all this and make your avatar or whatever they call it and do all this stuff. And so, in my opinion, the virtual world is the best example of what we end up when we have autonomy. And what do we have? We have a world that is filled with the dark web, uh, it's filled with human trafficking, um, it's filled with some of the worst um, derivations of what, and just disruptions of the human mind. Um, I've gotten to work a couple of search warrants against child pornographers. And it was interesting to me, and thankfully, um, the search warrant piece of it for me was just going around looking for stuff and not having, I don't have to do the forensics part of it, which is there's people that are specially trained to verify that it is indeed child porn and not uh, um, commercial stuff, which is still atrocious. But I had a conversation with a gentleman who does that, and he told me that when they arrest these guys, they pull their computer and they dig through their history to try to figure out where, how did they get to there? Like, how does a mind get so deprived that you need a child for sexual arousal? That is insane. And he talked about how the spiral of depravity that starts, and it starts with looking at this, then goes to hardcore, then satanic bondage, and then bestiality, then alternate lifestyle, until it and that is kind of the bottom of where it hits. And then it goes from there doing it into actually touching a child. And that's obviously what our goal in law enforcement is, is to make that never happen. But that is where autonomy gets humanity. And anybody that says otherwise is truly not thinking through the problem. We know that lawlessness only produces chaos and death. Name any country in the history of this world that is surviving and thriving in a lawless environment. It doesn't exist. But yet, recognize that that is why human, that is why, that is, this is the fight. This is why doctrine of creation and theory of evolution is the heart of the fight, is they do not want to concede to the fact that there's a lawgiver, because they do not want to face the laws. And that is the heart of it. And I say this as an encouragement. And as another tool to use when you talk with people, because this is what it gets down to. They don't want to recognize that there is a lawgiver. <coughs> All right, so we're in the life application fairly fast. Um, look at that. I might even get done a little soon here. <coughs> Excuse me. So the life application this has been a, for me, it's been a very fun three, three weeks I, I enjoy teaching. Hope all of you have learned something. But I want you to walk away 
with this. Recognize you have to make a choice. One, you can ignore the issue. Revelation 3, 14 to 22 is when uh, Jesus talks to the church of Laodicea. It's where he chastises them for being lukewarm. And I don't know how you look at eschatology, and I don't want to get into that, but I'll say this. You cannot deny that the consumer church that we're moving into, this is, this is what we're moving into, where you are encouraged to hold up unity above veracity. So do not stand on his truth if it's going to divide us. And I agree with that when it comes to uh, the non-essentials, you know, how you feel about soteriology, which is, you know, does God um, save us through kind of a Calvinist point or, or more of a dispensational? Like that is, we're, we're, that is not a divisive point. How you look at eschatology, are we amillennial, are we premillennial? Not a divisive point. Um, that, those are not points to divide. You know, we come together and we can have what you would call intramural debates and we love each other and we act in grace and we're merciful with each other. But when it comes to the fundamentals, we must stand, and we cannot depart from the fundamentals of what we believe. We cannot, the resurrection, the incarnation, the atonement, grace through faith alone and Christ alone is revealed in the Scripture alone to the glory of God alone. We cannot depart from those in the name of unity. And that's why we have, you know, full-time pastors, and that's their job to be a shepherd. Um, you know, I'm kind of working on a project I call it uh, spiritual sheepdogs, which is kind of like more people. I call myself a bivoluntary pastor. <laughs> it's kind of a play on the words bivocational because, you know, I'm, I'm here on a voluntary status. But there's so many, there's such a need right now for what, uh, so like the sheepdog, right? If you're not familiar, Philip Keller wrote a great book. Uh, what's the name of it? Lesson to a Sheepdog. Somebody's got to know that book. It's a classic book. Lessons from a Sheepdog, Lessons from a Shepherd. Psalm 23, ah, Philip Keller, it's a great book. I'll get you the name, but what a sheepdog does, right? You have all these sheep, which sheep are notorious. I've never been a cattleman, but I guess they're notorious for not being a very bright animal, um, herd animal. They just, they're not intrinsically smart. And so shepherds, they will use sheepdogs, you know, the border collies that have like 7,000 units of energy and just all over the place, and and but they're just crazy, the good ones are crazy obedient and intense, and like, go, sh-. and if you've ever got to see, like, the, an old man, I, one of the coolest things I got to, uh, Scottish Highland Games, and this old gentleman came out, the staff, and they were herding, I think, geese or something, and man, this dog was so cool, like, he'd whistle or make noises, and the dog was so intense, and just his focus on that shepherd was so inspiring, I mean, it just instant obedient, I mean, the dog would be going to I mean, it was crazy. And, you know, it's made me think that we need more of that in our congregation. We need more men and ladies who are steeped in the Word. Because if we just depend on Pastor Greg and Pastor Chris, we just we can't get that far. There's more to it. We have so much wealth of men who know the Bible and men who know how to lead that aren't specifically at the pulpit. And that's kind of what... I'm working on, and, you know, if you're interested in that, let me know, but who are intently gazing at the shepherd and doing whatever they can to help. And obviously the pastor is an extension of our shepherd, Jesus the Christ. The other option you have, so let me back up one question. Don't every, every, every truth in the Bible that's plainly revealed is worth standing on, all right? And we're going to have differences on stuff that's not so, so plainly revealed, but that's my point there. The other option you have, is capitulate to the lie, Genesis 3.1, the classic, has God indeed said? And that's what this fight is about. When we fight this fight with Christians, it's always like, is it really six literal days? Is that really what God said? Yeah, it's literally what God said. It's, I don't know what to tell you. And oh, by the way, the way he talks about death being his enemy coming from man only undergirds the fact that it is six little days. It must be six little days. Um, there's a beautiful passage there in Proverbs 12, and it just talks about, again, my cautionary tale to people who, Christians who hold to the theory of evolution is this. If you read this proverb here, 12, 17 to 22, God 
abhors a false witness. It should be terrifying to even think of the fact that I'm going to take an all-perfect, holy, omniscient, infinite God, and I'm going to accuse him of something that he clearly said he hasn't done. That should be terrifying. I mean, again, have we lost all fear of God? And I know I'm not talking so much to people here, but maybe there's someone who's listening who's wrestling with this topic, and I would caution you to be very careful. And I do have a couple more points. So it all comes down to this. I'll pass Gray left. I'll just point out. So this has been these three weeks. Um, believe it or not, I've taught you all a lot of classical apologetics. Um, I've tried to package it in a way where I don't use the word so I don't intimidate you. Um, I've taught you the cosmological argument, which is uh, everything has a cause, so we must have an unmoved mover. We've talked about the teleological argument, which is there is design, there must be a designer. Uh, we've talked about the moral argument, which is if there's law, there must be a lawgiver. Um, and this last point here is what's referred to in logic as a syllogism. Okay, so we've talked about all these terms, ambassador for Christ, God's truth, doctrine of creation, and what you're seeing here are two premises, all right? The first premise there is ambassadors for Christ stand on God's truth. We talked about that the first week. We established that truth. Uh, the doctrine of creation is God's truth. We've established that this week, and we've, we've uh, reconfirmed that, reaffirmed that today. And the last part of the syllogism is you have two truths, right? And here's our conclusion. Therefore, ambassadors for Christ proclaim the doctrine of creation. <clears throat> So if, if you get into logic and you like this kind of thing, just kind of the three-part process is you have terms. Uh, terms must be clear or unclear. That's the only thing a term can be. And we talked about that, how a lot of times when you're arguing with your spouse, you're arguing over a term that's unclear. And I'm amazed to this day uh, at my ability to misunderstand my wife. It's like a special talent I have. I like, <laughs> you know. I thought when you said wash the dishes to put them close to the dishwasher, like I was, I really thought that was what you meant. Um, <laughs> so maybe that's just me. So we've already established all these terms are clear. That's why I spent a lot of time ensuring that you understand exactly the terms I've been talking about. The next part of a syllogistic argument is, are my premises true or false? Every one of those statements are true. We talked about it. Ambassador of Christ stand on truth. We know that. Doctrine of creation is God's truth. That's the truth. That last truth, ambassador for Christ, proclaim the doctrine of creation. That's uh, necessary. So the last piece is, is this argument valid? Does this conclusion necessarily follow the two premises? And I would argue that it does, and that's what I've been building upon. <clears throat> so if you have enjoyed these Three weeks. One thing I'm looking at doing is uh, this summer I'm, I've got to finish my schoolwork here in the next two months. Hope I survive. So say a prayer for me if you get a chance. Um, but I'm looking at doing a classical apologetics course. I've had some people say they're interested in, in this kind of study. Um, Pastor Greg went through a very intense six week version. <laughs> I would probably do it over about three or four months because it is, um, I promise you, everyone in here can understand the philosophy and the tools of classical apologetics. It's just something that most of us were never taught. I wasn't taught logic or philosophy as a child. I only started doing this once I started my, my schoolwork as well. Um, so anyway, I say all that to say this. If you're interested in it, if we have five or ten people that are interested in it, I'll probably do the course. So just mark your connection card, say I'm, I'm interested in that kind of thing. And uh, I will teach you the classical apologetic methodology to defend the faith, which is about 12 points, which takes you from the foundation of truth to the proclamation of the Trinity. There's no argument that classical, uh, classical apologetic methodology can't answer. What you see when you do it, though, and why I keep stressing the heart, I have yet, and I'm sure there's somebody out there who, like a Bill O'Reilly who can make me think that my name is not my name. That person, I'm sure, is out there. But I have found through my own anecdotal experience that it's always a heart issue. 
Very rarely does a person have a cogent argu- argument against God's truth. It's God's truth. It's, it's undeniable. He said that. It's a hard issue. That is why our witness is so powerful. And that's why the Bible, I believe, talks about that a woman's character can bring a husband around. Because it's, it's a hard issue. People don't want to believe in the doctrine of creation because they don't want to believe in God. It's not that they've looked at the evidence and there is no God. It's that, no, God. I don't want you. It's a hard issue. All right, let's pray. (coughs) Excuse me. (coughs) Lord, I just want to thank you for this land. We live here in North Idaho. Thank you for this church family. (coughs) And Lord, I thank you for this opportunity you've given me over these three weeks to come and hopefully not just proclaim your truth, but help arm our congregation with some tools, some encouragement, some inspiration. Because no man is an island. You, you made this church as a body of Christ, and we all have a role to play. And I pray that everyone will have been inspired in some way to grow in proclaiming your truth, to grow in defending your truth. And Lord, as this Wuhan virus showcases there are so many people who need your hope. There are so many people that need to see the rocks of peace, trust, and joy that we are because we have you. We know that no matter what happens, that we are saved by you, you'll empower us, and your kingdom will come. So I just pray, Lord, that as we leave and as we go through these next months, that we lean on that knowledge, the knowledge that you are a good God. You love us. You desire all to be saved. I pray that everyone here, Lord, takes that information and either takes it out to the world or if they need to know you. They don't leave here today without reaching out to a pastor or another man of God, another lady of God, and say, I want to know more. Help me. Lord, it's a hard issue, Lord. I pray that you break our hearts for those who are lost. And I pray that those who are lost, you'll break their heart so that they come to you. All these things are doing in Jesus Christ's loving name. Amen.